You're watching the sermon of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's sermon is preached by Pastor Scott McGrady. Well, if you take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 2, we're going to wrap up chapter 2 here this morning. Romans chapter 2, we'll be looking at verses 25 to 29. Romans chapter 2, verses 25 through 29. As you, you turn there... Um, I'm not really a uh, a big soda guy, <laughs> in the sense that there's not a whole lot of different kinds of soda that I like, really. I'm really limited. Um, I do really like my favorites, probably Sunkiss or Orange Crush. They're, they're pretty close to each other. I think they're, they're, they're good, but probably followed by Mountain Dew. Um, the, uh, the original flavor, though, I, I've tried one of the other flavors, and I really didn't like it. Um, but I like Sprite. I do. I like it. Um, I can drink 7-Up, but I can't even swallow root beer or birch beer or any of those cherry-flavored sodas. That's And then cream soda? That's just wrong. Um, so, But of those like three good kinds of soda, they are all the better in a glass bottle, right? Um, although as I creep closer to 40... I find that even though I do like soda, that when I drink it, I usually regret it. Usually it doesn't make me feel very good. Um, but nonetheless, I, I can get pretty excited if you were to hand me a cold glass bottle of Sunkiss or Crush. But what a dirty trick it would be to hand me a bottle with a Sunkiss label on it, only for when I took my first gulp, I find out it's really creamsicle soda inside. And that's just, ugh. And I would look to you and say, how mean was that? And you may say, what do you mean? It's a bottle of Sunkiss. I'll say, no, it's not. It's nasty cream soda. And you might point to the label and insist, no, it's Sunkiss. That's what the label says. Well, guess what? I'm not really going to care what the label says when what's in the bottle is gross cream soda. What good is the label when it doesn't match the content inside the bottle? The label at that point is useless. And in a silly little way, that illustrates the point that we see in the text. Not about wrong labels on bottles, but the external label not matching the internal reality. That's what we see in our text. As we keep working our way through Romans, remember Paul is showing how the gospel is the power of God for salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And the gospel is the power of God for in it, the righteousness from God is revealed from faith to faith. And so in uh, defending this thesis and so showing the necessity of the righteousness from God that's revealed in the gospel, Paul has been showing how Gentiles, he starts in chapter 1, showing how Gentiles are without righteousness and so in need of this righteousness from God. And then as we've gotten into chapter 2, specifically as we got to verse 17, Paul began to show how the Jews are also unrighteous and so they are in need of this righteousness from God because as Jesus said in the gospels, without righteousness, no one will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, we have seen in this section, as as Paul has been focusing on the Jews, the false hope that the self-righteous Jews had. As Paul had been showing how the Jews would really be no better off in the coming judgment than Gentiles. And Paul effectively showed how all they were hoping in was, again, a false hope. So they hoped in the things that we went over. And Paul said that, that one is called a Jew. They're identified with the people of God. And they rested on the law and they boasted in God. But they did not keep his law. And though they saw themselves as teachers of others, they didn't teach themselves. They they didn't practice what they preached. Showing then that they really did not know God. And though they boasted in him, 
Their false hope led to hypocrisy that led to God being blasphemed among the Gentiles. And so that's what we've, we've gone over as we've been studying through Romans. Now, as we come to this text here this morning, Paul continues to show that the mere possession of the law really means nothing if you do not keep the law. And so he's building on that. And as we come to verse 25, he comes to a specific command that's in the law. This command that is a sign for the Jews' participation in the chosen nation, a sign of the Abrahamic covenant, which is circumcision. Clearly, if the Jews had a false hope in possessing the law, then it only stands to reason then they would also have a false hope in circumcision in thinking that this mark of being the people of God, this this external mark of the Abrahamic covenant, would keep them from God's wrath and judgment. And so, this again was a false hope. And so, again, Paul is showing that just because you have the law, or now too, just because you have circumcision, all of that really means nothing if you do not obey the law. And in not obeying the law, you show that the internal reality that the external sign of circumcision was supposed to show really didn't exist. And so that's what we see here in this passage. So if you would, read along with me as I read Romans chapter 2, verses 25 through 29. For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. So provided in the law was circumcision. And circumcision was first commanded when God reassured Abraham that he was going to fulfill the promises he made in the covenant that he made with Abraham that Abraham would indeed have a son, and that God would bless him and make him a blessing. And that God would make this great nation out of him, and he would, they would possess the land that God was giving them. And then we see there, that God expands then on the covenant promises that he made to Abraham. And in doing so, he changed his name from Abram, which means exalted father, to Abraham, which means a father of a multitude. Because in the expansion of these covenant promises here, God promised to make Abraham into a multitude of nations. And as he does this, then we read in Genesis chapter 17, verses 9 through 14, it says, And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and that sh- it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or brought with, bought with your money from an, any foreigner who is not of your offspring, Both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So this was a sign of God's covenant with Abraham and his descendants. And as we discussed in our study of Abraham's life over the summer, God's covenant with Abraham was unconditional. And so God was going to do exactly what he said, and it all relied on God to do exactly what he said he would do. God would make Abraham into a great nation. God would bless him and his offspring. 
and his descendants, that great nation Israel, would be blessed in order that they would be a blessing to all the families of the earth. God was going to do it. It was unconditional. And not only did we see that this was an unconditional covenant, but it was also an everlasting covenant for Abraham and his descendants. Though, as we discussed in the summer, not all of Abraham's descendants would partake in this. But for each individual to know the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant, they had responsibility. And one of those we see was in the keeping of circumcision. And it is a sign. And it's, it's remarkable, as you think about all of this, that this was something that marked the male's reproductive organ. And as you think about it, it makes perfect sense. As the covenant included seed, uh, and so for the descendants of Abraham, and, and this was to be extended through the generations, distinguishing a person as a member of the covenant promises. And since it was such a private mark, it would remind that individual of who they were, that you are a descendant of Abraham. You are an Israelite. You're not an Egyptian. You're not a Philistine. You're not a Persian. You are an Israelite. You are named among God's chosen people. And this was instilled in the law that was passed down from God through Moses. As we read in Leviticus chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, If a woman conceives and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days. As at the time of her menstruation, she shall be unclean. And on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. And so as Paul is talking about this in our text here for this morning in Romans, we see that this physical circumcision really only had meaning if one was spiritually circumcised. And that, that's the whole point of this, this text that we're in this morning. And so he starts talking about circumcision there in verse 25, saying, For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. And one can really only keep God's law from a changed heart, obeying God out of love for God. And even then, the law is not kept perfectly. And so no one can depend upon the law, depend upon their keeping of the law to save them. Because God in his law demands perfect per perfection. So if you are going to depend on the law or any part of the law, like circumcision, then the truth of the matter is you need to keep the whole law. If, if that's your plan to be right before God, to escape his judgment, then you need to keep the whole thing. You can't just pick and choose. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul says the same thing in Galatians chapter 5, verse 3, when he says, I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. And so we see here, as, as we continue looking at verse 25, Paul says, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. If you break the law, you might as well not be circumcised. So what good is it to put your hope in that? It's just a false hope. And Paul has already shown that the Jews do not keep the law, as he's shown that the Gentiles don't uphold the standard of the law either. So on what basis would they think that circumcision should protect them from God's wrath? We have to know and understand that no mere outward sign could ever make one right with God. Now, what good is it to look good on the outside, to have all the right external markings of one who's right with God, when really on the inside one's heart is full of all kinds of idolatry and lust and bitterness and deceit and, and covetousness, and, and on and on we can go. What good is it, then? Now, again, that's not to say that there's no value in circumcision. 
But how valuable is something that is supposed to demonstrate an inward reality when that inward reality didn't exist? The outward circumcision was to show an inward circumcision, a circumcision of the heart where sin is cut away. In the book of Deuteronomy, and the word Deuteronomy means the second law or the second giving of the law, and it's there in Deuteronomy that Moses is reiterating the law and the covenant promises and curses, reestablishing that covenant with the children of the generation that came out of Egypt after that generation died off, uh, because that generation did not obey God. When God first brought them to the promised land and told them to take it, they disobeyed. And so God made them wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And then in that time too, all they did was grumble and they rebelled against God and they did not circumcise their children. And so now before going into the land, as Moses is speaking to their children, he's reiterating the law and establishing, reestablishing the covenant with them. So that's what we see going on there. And so we read then in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16, Moses says, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. And so we see this is the idea of the inward circumcision. One's outward religiosity that is not from the heart is no better than those who do not have an outward sign. And therefore, as Paul is addressing the Jews in this, such a Jew might as well just be a Gentile. Because it's not going to do anything for them. And listen, as we understand and know from what Scripture says, that salvation for us as Gentiles is the same as it is for the Jews, and salvation in the New Testament is the same as it is in the Old Testament, as we see that and know that, we can take these things and apply it to ourselves as well. And therefore, we should ask such questions as, what good is my baptism? Or what good is receiving communion? Or my church membership? Or responding to an altar call? Or signing the card? Or or raising my hand because the preacher said to? I see that hand back there. What good is all of that external things when it does not affect the heart? If it brings no conviction of sin, no mourning over one's sin, it brings no love for God, and so therefore no love for the things that God loves, it brings about no, no desire to honor him with our lives, and so it brings about joyous obedience to him. If it doesn't do any of that, what's the point? What good is it? If instead, all our outward religiosity does with an uncircumcised heart, is allow us to remain in our sin, loving our sin instead of loving God, and so being stiff-necked and stubborn, refusing to submit to our Lord. What good is that? And really, though, the truth is, such a heart change, such circumcision of the heart, this, what is conversion, really, is something that ultimately the Lord does by his sovereignty. Again, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, we read this. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Apart from this work of God, to circumcise the heart, one is dead in their sin. They're separated from God in their sin. And so really what we're talking about here is the work of God to bring spiritual life, that a person would then repent and believe. And again, it's the same in the Old Testament. It's right there. And so just as all that showed one to be a physical descendant of Abraham, of being a Jew on the outside, was not a guarantee of being right with God, we have to understand that neither are any of our or anyone else's religious practices and traditions or good works. Matter of fact, placing your hope in such things to make you right before God actually demonstrates that you're not right before God. 
Because if you do not keep God's law, if you do not keep his standard of righteousness, then despite any of these things, you have no righteousness. I mean, what have we already read Paul said earlier in Romans? It is the doers of the law who will be justified. Therefore, circumcision only has value if one does, if one obeys the law. And so as Paul is saying all of this, and explaining why one's circumcision means nothing if they break the law, that their circumcision actually becomes uncircumcision, he even draws a conclusion to this in verse 26. As you see there in verse 26, in the, the English Standard Version, it says, so, or it could be translated as, therefore. And he shows this conclusion that he draws by comparing the circumcised man who does not keep the law with the uncircumcised man who does keep the law. If there was such a man who could keep the law perfectly and be saved which Paul will point out in chapter 5, that all are in Adam, and therefore all are sinners in Adam. And so it's impossible for any of us to keep the law perfectly. But for the sake of argument, as we've already seen Paul do before, he's saying that if there was an uncircumcised man who did keep the law, if someone did keep the precepts of the law, and we're uncircumcised, he says, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Again, for circumcision was supposed to be a symbol of an inward reality. And so keeping the law would show a heart that desired to please God, a heart that was right with God. And so therefore, that would be just as good as circumcision. Because the content, not the label, is really what matters. And again, that's Paul's whole point in this section. That's what he's getting at. And so saying that, I just want to make a side note too here. Because there, there are those who are brothers and sisters in Christ. And those who I love dearly, those who I'm very grateful for, those who have had an impact on my life, and, and I'm so thankful because I probably wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for some of them. And yet among them, there are those who would say that this passage then is teaching that really then the church is true Israel. That this passage shows that since it's, it's all about the heart and the conversion and circumcision of the heart, that's what makes it real and true. That's a true Jew. As even we, we see in verse 28, Paul says, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, in verse 29, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart. They say, see, so if your heart is circumcised, then you are a Jew. And therefore the church is true Israel. But that's not what this passage is saying. This passage is not extending Judaism to Gentiles who believe on Christ and so the church. What it's doing is saying, no, we, we see all of Israel. It's taught that all of Israel it, it are true Jews. But, but really, when you look at what Scripture says, it actually narrows down who the true Jew really is. To the one who is a Jew on the inside. That's what Paul's saying here. His whole point is the external doesn't matter, it's really the internal that matters. And again, these are some who I owe a great deal to. I am so thankful for their ministry. And so really, that should be a lesson to us. That whoever we hear from, and I've told you before, keep me accountable to what the Word says. Always take what you hear from me or anyone else who stands in this pulpit or whoever teaches Sunday school take what they say, and go back to the Scriptures and ask, does God's Word really say that? We have to do that with whoever we hear, on the radio or on TV or whoever it is. Always go back and take it and measure it against Scripture. And I also think there's a lesson for us that we should also be careful. Because though we might be able to say to them and come to them and say, I think you're reading your tradition into the text— we could approach them with our noses high in the air as if we 
could never be susceptible to reading our tradition into the text. As if we've never done that and could never and don't. And really, that's a prideful position to take. And I would say it's a very wrong one. And so we need to be careful with that. We ourselves need to always be taking what we hold to and what we believe and re-examining it against the scriptures. Asking, am I reading my tradition into the text? Or am I letting the text speak for itself? And we're all susceptible to that. And we have to be humble enough to recognize that, or else we won't be able to come to the text and ask that question. And therefore, we won't be able to have the text correct us when we are wrong. We always need to be re-examining what we hold to and what we practice and, and bringing it back. Is that what the text says? Right? That's, that's what we've been doing for how long when it comes to church government, right? We've been asking, is that our tradition that we've read into the text, or is that what the text says? And I think as we've worked through it, we've seen that it's been our tradition that we read into the text. What does the text really say? And that's what matters, because that's what it means for us to say the Bible is our authority. Otherwise, we've made tradition on the same level as the Bible. And so we need to be humble and approach every text with humility, asking, what does the Scripture say? Okay, that's my soapbox, so I'll get off that and move on. Um, but I think it's an important point. So again, if one could really keep God's law, keep his standard of righteousness fully, perfectly, their whole life, that one would escape judgment. But one who does not obey the law should not think that he will escape judgment. But one who does not obey the law again, has to understand that it's not about just the externals. Just because outwardly one's Jewish, that doesn't mean that they're right before God. And we ourselves, we should think that whatever we would hold to that we think makes us good Baptist or what makes us a good Christian on the outside, we should not think that that will cause us to escape judgment. Because we have to understand that the mere appearance of righteousness does not constitute true righteousness. And not only is it true that the one who keeps the law will be regarded as being circumcised because he's showing that inward reality, but it's also true, as we see in verse 27, that the one who is not physically circumcised but keeps the law will condemn the Jew who does not keep the law, but breaks it despite having the law and being circumcised. Now, this is not the idea that the one who is uncircumcised and keeps the law will be the judge of the Jew who's circumcised and breaks the law. But instead, those who are not circumcised, yet keep the law, worsen the condemnation in judgment of those who have the law, are circumcised, and yet violate the law. Remember, as we've seen earlier in Romans, that in God's impartial judgment, he will take into account how much light one has been given. And we've seen in Romans that all, through creation, have been exposed to enough light to hold each person accountable before God. But the unbeliever takes that light and suppresses the truth that's been revealed to them about God in order to hold on to their sin. And yet we've seen that even Gentiles have an innate understanding of God's standard of righteousness. They have a conscience. They know right from wrong. So those who do not have God's special revelation, as not everyone was given God's special revelation, not everyone was given God's objective law written down as those who have the law passed through Moses. And so those who do not have God's special revelation, those who do not have his written law, those who are not outwardly circumcised and yet keep God's standard, by doing so, they heap more condemnation on those who have all the more light given to them and yet remain in their sin and rebellion against the God who they claim to know. 
And now in really understanding everything that Paul is saying here, we have to ask, you know, what is it in, in all these points that Paul's making? What is he doing? And what he's doing is he's, he's taking everything that the, the self-righteous Jew would hold to and he's flipping it on its head. That the self-righteous Jew would argue that, that they would escape judgment having the law and being circumcised and that it's the uncircumcised Gentile who will be condemned in their sin. And that they, the Jew, will heap more condemnation on the Gentile. And so by flipping all of these ideas on their head, Paul is condemning the self-righteous Jew who has not responded to God rightfully despite all that God has given them to do so. And so again, he's showing the unrighteousness of the Jews. And he continues to explain all this as you come to verse 28, and you read there, for... And so he explains why a Jew who is circumcised but doesn't keep the law will be regarded as being, as not being circumcised. He says this is the case, verse 28, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. If you have not been tracking with me this whole time, just know the whole point is The external is never really what was the most important thing. It's not really what matters without the internal. The internal is the most important. The internal is what matters. That's his point. Religious rituals were never really what mattered. And as we think about that, and we think about modern Christianity... We have to understand that there is so much that passes as Christianity today that is just striving to make people moral on the outside, but really cares nothing about a heart change. But as long as I can feel better about myself, as long as I can do something about my guilt, and again, make myself feel better, I can pat myself on the back and say, no, I'm really a good person. It's not really about loving God or anything like that, but just do better so I can feel better. And whatever I can do to be good, so what can I do? I can give more money to the church, I can be involved more, I can serve more and do things for other people, you know, all the things that that a good person does. I can do, 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 do on the outside while completely ignoring the heart of the matter, which is the heart. And that is not true Christianity. Not at all. Actually, it's pride. That's what that is. And very often it leads to despair because no matter how much I do, I find I can never do enough. The inward reality is what matters. And so mere religiosity is not the answer. And mere external behavior is not the answer either. But instead, when we know we're not good, when we know we have not upheld God's standard of righteousness, when we know we're actually wretched sinners, and that no matter how much we do, we're still lawbreakers, we can then rest and settle on the reality that Jesus kept the law for us, that Jesus was good for us. And Jesus paid in himself for our sin if we believe, and he paid for our sin out of his love for us. When we believe that, we trust in that, then we now so love him that we do what we do not to get something from God, And not to make ourselves feel better about ourselves, but we do what we do out of love for the God who so loved us. And so a Jew is really not a Jew if he's only one externally. Because if he hasn't seen what the holy, righteous God has done for him through his Messiah his heart remains unchanged. 
And so verse 29 says, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart. And so whether Jew or Gentile, we all have to ask ourselves, has there been a heart change? Is there an inward difference? Or if the reality is at the core of who we are, we've remained what we've always been. And my friends, the only thing that will make the true difference, that inward difference, is the gospel. It's the work of Jesus Christ. It's his life, death, and resurrection. It's clinging by faith to all who Jesus is and all that he has done. All that he's done to save us, to make us his own. It's putting away any thought of any effort and any work of our own, any of our religious practices, even biblical ones. Remember, God is the one who prescribed circumcision. God's the one who prescribed baptism and communion and the gathering of the church, and yet none of those can save us. None of those can make us right with God. But apart from the work of God, that brings about true saving faith in Jesus Christ alone, there will be no change of heart. One's practice and behavior that changes to meet an external standard and tries to establish one's own righteousness to be saved leads to hypocrisy as we went over last time in Romans. And also, too, it's a change that has no gumption to last. And trying to establish your own righteousness by what you do is empty. Because the whole point of this section is that no one's righteous. The larger section from chapter 1 through chapter 3. No one's righteous. But behavior that is affected from the heart, because the heart has been changed, and so now one lives in response to the fact that God has saved them, God has credited them with the righteousness that comes from him through Jesus Christ by faith, they live from a changed heart, which looks like love for God and a desire to please God, longing to know God more and more and living in great anticipation of that day when we're with God forever. I mean, if we love him, don't we want to be with him? Isn't that our great joy and longing? And so we live in light of that day. And that's the change that takes you from loving your sin, coddling it, living in habitual sin, to declaring war on your sin. Hating it. Hating whatever sin remains. Because you take joy in obeying your Lord and honoring him with your life. And that's your deepest desire. And again, this takes the work of God. This is not something we can naturally bring about in ourselves. And it takes the work of God, as we see there in verse 29, that it tells us that this inward reality, the circumcision of the heart, is done by the Spirit, not the letter. It's not the written law that was handed down through Moses. That really gave no power to keep the standard. But the change of heart is the work of God, writing God's standard, writing God's law on your heart, which is the idea of giving you the desire and the proper motivation to fulfill that standard. Though we still do not fulfill it perfectly, we still wrestle with sin. But it's out of a changed heart that we grow in it being more and more the pattern of our lives in obeying him and putting off sin. Because we love him and we want to honor him. And so we seek to obey joyously out of that love for him, rather than striving in our own strength for our own righteousness or to make ourselves feel better or so we can tell ourselves we're we're religious. What good is that? And so in all of this then, all the hypocrisy that comes with putting your hope in a false hope, like again, we went over last time, this change of heart tears down that hypocrisy. Because now instead of one's praises coming from man and that be what we're seeking, now one's praises comes from God. 
See, one who was Jewish and had all of the, the outward appearance of being Jew, being a Jew, he would be applauded, he would be praised by another Jew. And, and that's what he would seek out, at least the self-righteous Jew would. Just as we in our sin would do the same thing in seeking out the approval of men and living in the fear of men. But instead of doing the things for the praises of people, doing the things to please people, the things that are done from a circumcised heart are the things that are done to please God. And they are the things that receive his praises. And so listen, listen. If you receive praises from God, who cares if people praise you? If what you do is pleasing to God, who cares if people are pleased with you or not? What matters is pleasing God. And if we seek to live our lives for the praises of men, we're living our lives in idolatry. God's praises are what matters. You know, and there, there are those who uh, w- would say that there's a play on words going on here. Because as we've discussed before, the, the name Jew means praise. And so the Jew who is truly a Jew, not just one externally, but internally, his praises is not from man, but from God. And that is the desire of every changed heart. And listen, these are things that we've got to get straight. Because there is a great danger in external religiosity. There's a great danger in good works and and trying to be a good person or a good Christian. There's great danger in our religious heritage and, and whatever else we might be able to claim for ourselves. Because all of that can easily be mistaken for true Christianity. It can be even so self-deceived that we claim to be trusting in Christ alone for our salvation. And we can even know all of the right things to say. But truly, at the heart of our faith, we are trusting in our outward appearance. And what others think of us. And all that we do while our hearts remain hard as stone towards the God we claim to serve. As we remain unconverted in our cold, dead religion as we continue to love our sin and so not love God, that our motives are not to please him. But as long as I can outwardly maintain the external appearance of what a good Christian is supposed to be, we can tell ourselves we have true saving faith as we remain comfortable in our sin, what is often secret sins. But all whom God saves all who have faith in Jesus Christ and in Christ alone to save them, they have a circumcised heart. We read Paul's words in Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. It says, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. That's that internal, the spiritual circumcision. And Paul says here, it's by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, and this too is spiritual baptism, uh, not water baptism, which again is, is just as useless as physical circumcision to save you. But remember, the word baptize means to immerse. And so this is speaking of being immersed into Christ, that you are in Christ, that by faith you have Christ as your representative. And so when he died for your sins, those of you who are trusting in him, when he died for your sins, God counted it as your death for your sins. And when Christ was buried, you were buried, as as Paul says here, buried with him in baptism, in being immersed into Christ, having Christ as your representative. And Paul goes on here and he says, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So when we have Christ's saving work 
credited to us by faith, that we would be saved with the debt of our sin wiped clean because of the work of Christ, all those whom Christ in his work represents, they have circumcised hearts. They have new hearts. And that is what matters. These are those who are truly saved. And so listen, it is only right for us who profess faith in Christ to examine our faith. That we examine ourselves. We can we gotta be careful, we can do that too much where we are then making it about what we do. But we should do, as Paul told the Corinthians, to examine ourselves to test whether or not we're in the faith. Have we truly been transformed from the inside out that we are no longer who we used to be? Or have we sought after external compliances to justify ourselves, all the while at the heart of it we've never really changed? Where's the evidence that we truly believe? Again, you know we're not talking about sinless perfection. We all still wrestle with sin. We all still struggle and fall. We're not talking about sinful perfection. But do we now care about the things of God where we once didn't? Do we now want to please God and so search the scriptures to see what pleases him? Instead of living by the standard of good that's formed by our own opinions instead. Do you live a life that's based on, well, you know, I just feel or I think that instead of searching out what God has revealed in his word that pleases him. Do you hate your sin? And not just hate the consequences of your sin, but do you hate that you have offended the holy God who has so loved you? Do you hate it because you love him and you're so grateful for all that he has done to save you, to forgive you, to pay for your sin, to make you alive in Christ? Is there a circumcision of the heart showing itself in the warring against your sin and the pursuit of holiness? Brothers and sisters, are you a Christian outwardly only? Because it's the inward reality that counts. And if you look and find that there is no inward reality, if your heart has not been changed, friends, if you are resting in anything about you, instead of resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ for your salvation— and you're right standing before God, then I plead with you, turn away from even hate, any notion that there can be anything in you that will make you right before God, that anything about you will save you, any religiosity or any works that you do. Turn away from it all. Because it will not save you when you stand before God in judgment. Instead, trust in Christ and in Christ alone to save you. Trust that he was righteous for you. Trust that he paid for your sin and his suffering and death on the cross. Trust in his life, death, and resurrection. Trust in him and you will be saved. And being right before God, again, it is not religious rituals or heritage or any external label. But salvation is a matter of the heart. And salvation is in the heart of all of those who trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. So trust in him and you will be saved. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visitnbbc.com.